beyond and, and join the search for Earth-like planets. Satellites today are huge. They're the size of cars. They have wingspans out of a five-story building. And they are hugely expensive to build and test. But what if you could solve all of these problems all at once in a single package that you could build in your own backyard? What if you could build a satellite that looks like this? Well, this is a pretty big challenge. A challenge so big, in fact, that NASA created a contest called QQuest and put up $5 million for anyone who can do it. So back in December of 2014, I built a team of seven students from three schools across two states to do just that. But our dream extended even further. We dreamed about putting CubeSec technology in the hands of other students like us, in the hands of teachers building amazing classrooms, even in your hands. And we called ourselves Project Selene. Now, CubeQuest challenged teams to build a CubeSat that could get into orbit around the moon and talk to Earth. That didn't sound so hard, but we would soon find out why NASA was putting up $5 million for it. This is all the room you get for solar panels. That's not very much power if you're trying to talk to someone who's 230,000 miles away. This is a Pringles can. This is all the fuel you get to take with you. And the first problem we had to solve wasn't even technical at all. How would seven high school students come up with an insurance plan worth $1 million? Well, we did solve the insurance problem, but we realized that seven of us alone weren't going to solve all the problems that we were facing. We had a fairly solid initial design. But we would need a, need a much broader team to go in-depth into each subsystem, to gain specialized expertise, to develop a spacecraft that could actually fly. We needed students responsible for attitude control, propulsion, communications, power and electrical systems, among others. So we started looking for help. We were looking for students who were bright, self-motivated, not afraid, but excited to do difficult things. We asked students what they would bring to the team and match into positions where we knew that they would succeed. The design matured and the team flourished, but every success brought new problems. Spaceflight is expensive. It was clear that our design was going to cost over a million dollars, and that far exceeds your typical bake sale. <laughs> so we needed some more help. We needed team members who could reach out to local businesses and large corporations, team members who could raise money for the project, team members who specialize in social media and artists to render our designs. How many of you have heard of ITAR? It stands for International Trade and Arms Regulation. Well, as it turns out, spacecraft fall under the same regulation as munitions, and so we needed a team member who could help us pilot those waters. So we found students to fill these roles, too. And we ended up with a team of nearly 20 high school students from all across the country. We had all sorts of personality types, interests, and schedules. We had nerds. We had cool kids. We had students who loved science and students who hated science. So how do you take 20 outspoken, competitive, but undeniably brilliant teenagers and coordinate their schedules, motivate them, get them to work as a team. Well, we did it by building an environment that encourages asking questions, having discussions, and giving everyone, artists and engineer and social media alike, a chance to pitch their ideas to the group. We did this by meeting in my garage, meeting at Panera, taking over the iMac lab here at school, and working out of the conference room at our local library. We did this by utilizing massive group chats in an app called Telegram to trade ideas and share information, finding it worked far better than email. We did this by meeting in collaborative design reviews, where everyone on the team was invited to question and compliment each other's designs. And at the same time, we developed a culture. Some of the culture grew out of who we brought on. We interviewed every candidate, looking for students with a genuine excitement, students who were curious about the world and thrilled with the prospect of pushing boundaries. Some of our culture grew out of how we work. We work on the floor, at the library, at cafe tables, and always with laptops in tow. Our team has developed that laid-back, Silicon Valley attitude, working through texts and conference calls and at all hours of the day. Some of our culture grew out of when we work. I receive emails after midnight, and I often reply to them at 5 a.m. A testament to our laissez-faire attitude of work when it's best for you. Some teams become territorial. Some teams choose to see the trees instead of the forest and grow their trees at the expense of everyone else's. But our culture, from the beginning, revolved around the idea that everyone owned the entire spacecraft. Every system was critical to mission success, and as a result, everyone's input mattered. Now, I hate saying those words, everyone's input mattered, uh, because it's, I've been a member of other engineering teams that have failed, because they've used those very words. But the formality of everyone's opinion 
being voiced, never translated into a reality where those opinions actually mattered. But ours really did. For example, our propulsion team was struggling between chemical thrusters and electric propulsion. So we called a design review and invited everyone from our communications experts to our artists. Anyone could ask questions. How much power does each use? How much fuel does each need? And at the heart of the discussion was how our choice would affect the overall spacecraft. And then every member voted. Every opinion really mattered. It happens that the chemical thruster won the vote that day and is still being used in our design today. And at the same time, we fostered a culture of success. This was no homework assignment or college gimmick. This was us, a team of bright, driven high schoolers trying to pave the way for others like us to do the same. We knew that every adult we talked to thought we were crazy, but that wasn't a problem. We took it as a challenge. We're teenagers. It's our job to do the impossible. And the results were phenomenal. We built something more than a team. We built a community that students are excited to be a part of. And although we never set out to do this, we created a team that has become a family. New friendships have formed, sorrows have been shared, and in the same app used for technical discussions doubles as a channel for social events. We built an environment where everyone, regardless of their skills and interests, not only has a place, but has the opportunity to make a real impact. Students on this team are excited they know that they're solving real-world problems. They know that their work is paving the way for other students like them. And they know that one day, their work will put CubeSats in your hands. This was our design. It pioneers a new Air Force fuel that has the potential to be safer and more efficient than any before. It uses a long-distance radio that we plan to use amateur radio equipment to operate. And because we wanted our design to be usable by anyone, it uses as many off-the-shelf components as you can currently buy online. We had a solid design but we knew that we were going to need help actually building our spacecraft, help that would require some bigger friends. One day I explained to a lovely girl in English class what it was that our team was trying to do. Well, she went home that night and explained our project to her father over dinner. Her father works for Glenair, a company that manufactures hardware that's been used in space, and he was beyond excited to talk to us. He invited our team to present the mission to his team. He organized a panel of engineers and gave us the opportunity to have our design disassembled and critiqued, and we learned an awful lot that day. We learned that we were going to need to step up our game if we actually wanted to compete in CubeQuest. We learned that our design was actually pretty feasible. But the most important thing that we learned was that we were doing something exciting, something that adults were willing to support. And we walked out that day with a pledge of half a million dollars. Spurred by the success, we walked into the first CubeQuest tournament with our heads held high. We faced a panel of veteran NASA engineers over a video call and, developed, and delivered our presentation with all the confidence that we could muster. And then we looked online at a newly posted list of our competitors' names. We went down the list in order. Corporation, Corporation, UCSD, MIT, Cornell. And we found no other high school teams. In fact, we could find no other high schoolers involved anywhere. We received the results of Grand Tournament 1 at a second video conference. Every team was logged on. It was a little daunting to call in. NASA announced the top three teams. First place was won by an independent team of professional engineers. Second place by MIT, third by Cornell University. At our next team meeting, we just glanced around at each other. The fact that we were crazy had finally caught up to us. But just like before, we viewed it as a challenge. We may not win, I said, but that was never our intention. Our, our goal was to put CubeSats in the hands of ordinary high school students like us. Even if we don't fly, we're still proving that it can be done. And besides, we've already come farther than our parents expected us to. There is no reason to stop now. So we didn't. We went back to texting and diagramming and checking our inboxes, and I found two interesting things in mine. The first was a lovely letter from a student on the Cornell team. He congratulated us for competing in GT1 and commended our goal to make CubeSat technology accessible to the public. The second was from a Professor Carrie Cahoy from MIT. She too congratulated our team, but she had done a little more research than we had anticipated. She had gotten a hold of a draft of our technical report placed under an ambiguous name on a web server that we had forgotten existed. And she commented that our design was very similar to her team's design. She was working out here at JPL, and she asked if she could meet us in person so that we could discuss merging teams. This is the team today. We're competing in CubeQuest under the name MIT Kit Cube. And at the same time, we have the Project Celine team compiling data from GT1, GT2, from MIT, and hopefully when CubeQuest is over, from Cornell and the other competing teams. Our ultimate goal is to build checklists, spreadsheets, vendors, everything you need 
to build your own CubeSat. And then we're going to publish everything online in a Wikipedia-style database where anyone, students, teachers, even you, can go to learn how to build your own. What if you could have Wi-Fi anywhere in the world? What if you could explore asteroids or reach even beyond our own solar system? Our spacecraft is going to be the first of its kind to achieve lunar orbit. What will your box do? Thank you.